good afternoon, whatever time zone you're in. I'm Bill Bregan, Executive Artistic Director of the Arts Center at NYU Abu Dhabi. And I am here in Abu Dhabi. I'm very sorry that Lindsay and I weren't able to be in with you, but uh, we are grateful to David Bale and the entire team at ISPA for the opportunity to share this conversation with all of you. I also wanna thank Threshold Acoustics for sponsoring the session. I especially want to acknowledge all of our colleagues in the field, all the artists, the producers, the presenters, and everybody working behind the scenes. This has been an incredibly difficult few years, and I want to take a moment to thank you all for your individual and collective efforts to keep bringing meaningful creative work to our audiences. Today's conversation is about radical trust. It's about institutional risk-taking, adventurousness, and expanding accessibility. It's about responding to the challenges of our moment through investing in artists and innovation. It's about crafting transnational collaborations and models for intercultural performance, which hold equity and transparent communication as core values. It's about ways to leverage resources, financial, artistic, and human, to create powerful new work. It's about developing models with a lighter environmental footprint to circulate international work without having to move people around the planet. It's about creating a deep and radical presence between performer and audiencer. And it's about creating a deep connection with close collaborators from across the globe who have still never mostly met in person. We were actually hoping ISPA would be the excuse, but the world conspired against that. Uh, before we go into the conversation with all of us, I wanna give a brief history of how we all ended up here. When COVID-19 hit, the Arts Center, like all performing arts centers, had to reimagine its purpose. It's all too easy to succumb to the grief that comes with knowing how much we lost. We made a decision that rather than focus on the constraints resulting from the pandemic, we would focus on the opportunities to rethink our work and reinvent how we keep the performing arts at the center of our collective experience, both at NYU Abu Dhabi and in the larger global community. We decided to focus on commissioning new work, both UAE-based artists who could help us share local stories with the world, but also to invest in new forms of theater making, online, over the phone, with 3D immersive audio, and in other ways. Working with Christine Jones, Mara Isaacs, Brian Hunt, and Octopus Theatricals, one of the projects that we presented was Theater for One's Here We Are, which featured female playwrights of color from the US who created work that was addressing some of the urgent conversations happening there the summer of 2020 around issues of racial justice, around the presidential election, around issues of memory and loss. The experience in Theater for One was extremely powerful. It captured a thrilling sense of liveness in one of the most concentrated and focused audience or experiences you can imagine. We also remained hungry to expand our networks and to meet new people. So we started attending lots of online conferences and in August of 2020, I attended the Pan-African Cultural Exchange Conference, PACE. And I wanna give a shout out to Nikki Jonah and Erwin Moss for inviting me there. Because it was there at one of the opening sessions, I ended up meeting Karishma Bagani. I learned about her work with the Nairobi Musical Theater Initiative and in Uganda with Tebore, and, at her, and about her studies at NYU's Tisch School of the Arts in New York and all of the intersecting personal networks we shared it became clear we should develop some projects together. And of course, COVID continued to be an obstacle in bringing theater artists from East Africa to the UAE. So we remained stubbornly optimistic and came up with what we think was an even more inventive solution, one that would allow us to work with a broad cross section of theater artists, and at the same time, help bring them to audiences, not only in the UAE, but to audiences from around the world. We commissioned Theater for One, We Are Here, the Nairobi edition for the Art Center. This unique digital platform gave us a way to cross borders and deeper, deepen the art center's ties with the Kenyan theater community, building on the UAE's strong links with East Africa. It also allowed us to engage more deeply with the UAE's Kenyan expat community. Working with the Nairobi Musical Theater Initiative and Rainmaker Limited together with Octopus Theatricals, it proved to be a fruitful collaboration that expanded the cross-border dimensions of the art center's work further than ever. We're especially excited to have had a transnational creative and production team, some of whom you'll be meeting today, all working together in three countries on three continents to share their unique knowledge and experience. It struck a chord with audiencers from around the world, earning two extensions for its run and profound feedback from the audiencers. And it became a platform for deep engagement within the university and within our artistic community. I hope some of you had a chance to attend the revived run this week, which we hope will then inform the Q&A later. Theater for One is made by many. So now I'd like to introduce 
each of the panelists or allow them to introduce themselves actually in their role for Theater for One. I'll start with my ongoing collaborator, my right hand and friend, Lindsay Boswick, the Art Center's Director of Artistic Plan. Lindsay. Thanks so much, Bill. Hi, everyone. And so um, thrilled to be with you all, even in this virtual space. As Bill mentioned, I'm the Director of Artistic Planning at the Art Center at NYU Abu Dhabi. And if you're not familiar with our Art Center, we are a multi-venue and multi-genre performing arts center at American University based on the desert island of Sadiat Island in Abu Dhabi, the United Arab Emirates. We're in our seventh season and we really see ourselves as a laboratory that brings together new work, presented work, commissioned work, produced work, a lot of professional artists internationally, as well as fostering the local art system and looking at supporting faculty and student work at the university. One of the things that I specifically look at in my role is how do we take the work that we're developing, presenting, producing, and bring it to a larger context to look at ways that it can interact with our curriculum, with the local ecosystem, with research inquiry and questions that are much broader than specifically the arts practice. And Theater for One really gave us an incredible opportunity, not just to look at a new form, but to really look at themes, to look at the cultural history of the Kenyan and, and Nairobi performing arts scene, and also to work with wonderful artists that we hadn't met yet, and how that might fit into courses across the university, community groups, and really important public conversations, which is how we approach all of our work. And we're really gonna dive a bit more into that later in the conversation. Uh, I would like to now introduce uh, the incredible Brian Hunt, who serves as the associate producer and production coordinator for Theater for One and Octopus Theatricals more broadly. Yeah, thanks, Lindsay. Uh, uh, I'm Brian. Um, I'm the associate producer and production coordinator for Octopus Theatricals. And Theater for One is one of the uh, several projects that we produced, uh, and I felt um, incredibly tied to and a, a special care for. Um, Octopus Theatricals is an independent producing organization. We're based in New York. Um, we have a really wide range of projects that we support and uh, facilitate. And uh, Theater for One um, uh, being the one we're talking about today. Uh, and I'll go ahead and kick it over to uh, Christine Jones, who was there with you in person uh, at BAM who is the artistic director and creator of Theater for One. Hello, everybody. Uh, I feel like a conduit between the virtual and the physical. Um, so my name is Christine Jones, and I created Theater for One almost 20 years ago. Some of you may have even heard us do a pitch at IPSPA in 2015 or 2016. So we've been creating work in our physical booth for the last 20 years on and off, and as as context and background, I would like to show you a video of Theatre for One in its physical incarnation. When you go to see a play on Broadway, you're there with a thousand other people. It's a shared experience. This is you alone. The whole experience is just about you. You have somebody sitting just an arm's length away from you and feel like you're actually making a connection with the actor. It's just unlike anything I've seen before. I could see you weren't expecting me. You don't get that in most theatrical experiences. It's intensely intimate. When you're seeing more traditional theater, you're a bit more anonymous. You can yawn, you can check your phone, but when it's just you and there's eye contact for the entire time, you suddenly feel like you're responsible for the quality of the performance. Are you lost? Or are you just waiting here for something or something? If that had been in a theater, in a play, I don't think I would have necessarily had the same response, but because it was between the two of us, I think I was allowed to have an emotional response. The armor that I have to put on to go into the world was stripped away. 
it felt special to have a performance that was just Hi. unique to you, that even if someone saw those same words being said by the same person, they were never going to see that same performance. So uh, this is a little weird, I know. Well, at least it is for me. I think what this does is it wakes us up. It makes me feel alive, right? It's live theater. Oh, there are some other things I really wanted to talk to you about, but I'll talk to the next person. If I feel like it's a story that's been told and it's just slightly different, that's not exciting. This is exciting. This is the theater I want to be seeing. So even though we are a theater on and unto ourselves, a physical space, a, a company producing work, we thrive on our collaborations with our host venues, our host organizations. And at the time of the pandemic, we were invited by Arts Brookfield to create an online version of this experience, which is something we had always resisted, but this felt like the right moment to explore it. And as Bill mentioned, we, we made a piece of work that then was presented at NYU Abu Dhabi. And through Bill, we were connected with Karishma, who I would like to introduce now. Thank you uh, so much, Christine. Uh, good morning, everybody. Good evening for those that are tuning in. Good afternoon. Um, it gives me such great, great pleasure to be sharing the screen in the space uh, with my wonderful colleagues. I feel so horrible and devastated that we're not able to be there in person. But thanks to technology, uh, as you will discover throughout our conversation today, we're able to be here in, um, in spirit, of course, and, and on the screen. So uh, thank you so much for having us. And thank you to the entire ISPA team for making this possible. Uh, my name is Karishma. I am a creative producer and director based in Nairobi, Kenya. My work really uh, centers around being able to create sustainable creative platforms and support the production of works, uh, new works that are coming out of East Africa and across the continent for a regional and a global audience. And this is the reason why, among many other reasons, that Theatre for One this and this kind of collaboration was really, really exciting and inspiring and um, innovative to bring to the region, um, as, we'll, as we'll learn later on today. Um, I'd like to take this moment to uh, introduce uh, a video that focuses specifically on We Are Here, the Nairobi edition. It will feature our six commissioned playwright performers, Mumbi Kaigwa, Satawa Namwalie, Mercy Mutisia, and members of the Lamb Sisterhood, Laura Ekumbo Ann Mora, and uh, Alea Kasam. This knife represents a marriage in my story. Hi, this is my prop. My character has been here a very, very long time. Hello, this is Superfly, and he's part of the cast and my prop. You'll see more when you see us live. Hello, this prop is important to my character because she loves music. Hello, this is my prop. I'm a sharpshooter. Hi, this is a prop, my prop, and it represents the weird transitions in life, the crazy transitions in life. Thank you so much, Krishma, for sharing that with us. And uh, I'm really excited to have us all in dialogue for the next about 45 minutes. And then we're going to open it up to questions in the audience. Um, so the first thing I want to have you talk a little bit more, Krishma, about the curation of these artists. One of the things that I remember you mentioning was you really were excited about the idea of having artists from different generations especially with the history of Nairobi's cultural scene. I'm wondering if you can sh uh, share a little bit about that, uh, as well as some of your work with the Nairobi Musical Initiative 
of which many of these artists flow through. Absolutely. Uh, thank you so much, Lindsay. So, you know, over the last few years in my work in the industry, I found that there has been a very large disconnect between um, artists that had been practicing, you know, from the 60s and then new and upcoming artists as well. Um, and so I thought that this would be a wonderful opportunity to bring these artists into or in conversation with one another. And, and there was a specific desire to focus on women, largely because uh, there is a sort of historical generational tradition of women being sort of culture keepers of society in many ways. Um, there's a lot of traditions, there's a lot of, uh, not only in the performance context, but even the, you know, in, 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 a, in a domestic context, the women are, you know, the storytellers, they sort of pass down many rituals and traditions. So it felt really, really important to me to be able to highlight various approaches towards this kind of culture keeping and storytelling, um, and then have that be an intergenerational uh, dialogue as well. Uh, what I found um, in thinking about how to curate the artists is that we have folks like Mubi Kaigwa and Sita Namwale, who in many ways are, you know, what I like to call the mothers of Kenyan contemporary theatre, the founders of what, you know, emerging um, producers, creators like myself um, are practicing in today. And there's um, not enough space for that kind of dialogue with folks like Mercy, who, uh, you know, just recently launched in, in, in the scene. So, um, that's really the rationale behind um, the curation of some of these artists. And more specifically, I was able to get access uh, to some of these folks through my work as an associate producing director for the Nairobi Musical Theatre Initiative, which was founded um, by Eric Wainaina and Sheba Hurst, who uh, also run Rainmaker Limited with the support of uh, Roberta Levito. And this initiative um, is currently developing 14 new musicals that uh, tell original Kenyan stories for an African and a global audience um, and, you know, using the form of making plays with music or using the structure of musical theater. So I met the Lamb Sisterhood ladies, for example, through, uh, through the Nairobi Musical Theater Initiative and then the network just kept expanding. One thing I just want to pull out. Oh, sorry, Bill. Yeah, no, go ahead, go ahead. One thing I just want to pull out from there, which is in connection to what you were saying, is the that idea, and anyone can jump in on this, of we are here. And that I felt like it really came out of some of the focus of a lot of these artists. I'm wondering if you wanted to expand on that a little bit. Yeah. Um, I remember uh, the Zoom conversation that we had when we were thinking about the kind of theme that we wanted this to, uh, to focus on. And perhaps Christine can speak a little bit about here we are uh, being the former theme of the first, first iteration. Um, but, you know, with, with everything happening with the pandemic, with sto the, the current Kenyan stories that are out there in the market, it felt increasingly important to just meet the artists where they were at. And I really, um, I, I, you know, we, we oftentimes, especially with these intercultural collaborations, find ourselves in a bind where we have to tell stories based on what the funding demands for us to do. So you have to, you have to focus on a malaria narrative or you have to focus on HIV and AIDS. And that really um, restricts the artists to be as free to share their stories. So actually, while we had the conversation about we are here, when, when I spoke to the artists, I sort of said, it's, it's free reign, write whatever you want. And, and then we'll figure out how to curate it retro, retrospectively. So actually that's what ended up happening because then they started sharing some of their interests about uh, telling stories about their grandmothers or telling stories um, about uh, domestic issues. Um, and this is where we came up with the theme uh, collectively, which is we are here. Yeah, and I can add that uh -huh. when we do create a body of work, each time we create new work specifically for this venue, in collaboration with, as I said earlier, our host organization or location. And so we do a collaboration, whether it's with Arts Brookfield or NYU or Times Square Alliance for Public Art, and we begin to think about putting an ensemble together. We bring in usually six writers to write new work, and as a, a framing device, I give the writers a phrase which they are open to respond to in any way that they feel moved to. But it's a way of creating a body of work that is still connected, even though it is these individual microplays. So in the past, we've had phrases like, um, I'm not the stranger you think I am. And during mm -hmm. the pandemic, and I, sh I feel like I should say a little bit more about what the virtual platform is to help give context. So when, um, when Arts Brookfield first approached us, we were curious but hesitant. 
because some of the foundational principles of Theater for One revolve around a bespoke space that fosters this intimate connection, the essence of serendipity and surprise and encountering a stranger, and the intimacy of eye-to-eye -eye direct contact. That's one of the key elements of what makes Theater for One such, um, such an engaging experience. And as we all know, so much of our Zoom experiences involve not making eye contact and staring in the corner of your screen. And we're on Zoom or FaceTime or Instagram Live, and you're in the noise of those spaces. So when we set out to create an online portal platform, we worked with an incredible group of artists called Open Ended Group out of Chicago, which came out of another discussion we were having with University of Chicago. And they were masterful at working with us to build a bespoke space that is for Theater for One alone. It's not through FaceTime, it's not through Zoom, it's our own window and portal. And we were able to create adaptive technology so that the actor and the audience member both have the experience of looking at each other eye to eye at the same time, which is, is not to be taken for granted. You can pretend to look at the person by staring at the camera, but it's not the same of actually having that simultaneous feedback loop of, of meeting each other's gaze. And then also through the, the waiting room that we created, there's a, an initial experience that you have when you enter the space where you are connected with, with other strangers waiting in line with you, and then you get taken into your one-on-one -on -one performance. So that's a little bit more about what, what the virtual platform actually is. And when we started thinking about connecting writers and creating a, a, an ensemble, I don't know about you, but the phrase I kept finding myself say was, here we are, here we are during the pandemic, here we are, whether it was on Zoom or six feet away from each other. And so that became the phrase for the work that we did uh, originally as our first online creation. And then it felt really apropos to take those words and rearrange them and, and say, we are here. And to, to meet the artists, as Karishma said, where they are. So we are literally going into these performers' homes. And you are literally meeting the actor where they are. I think so many of our touring models involve bringing people to us, and this allows us mm. to go to them. And I think it's sort of building on that idea about sort of meeting the artists where they are. We had these two, two parallel tracks. So we had been presenting Theater for One, Here We Are, and we were, I think we found how profoundly it touched people to really be in a live, real-time performance experience. And at the same time, we were going through this process with Karishma, where she was talking us through all of the different projects and all the artists who were part of Nairobi Music Theater Initiative and all the different artists. And it was like, how do we choose from all these really interesting sounding projects when we don't know any of the artists? And I think as a, as a presenter, you have certain opportunities to go to a festival here and there, to go you know, to do a, do a visit and do some studio visits and see some rehearsals. But I think what we realized when we started sort of marrying the conversations with Karishma that were really gonna be about probably just one project with the Theater for One platform was that it gave us a chance as a performing arts center who was really interested in exploring those links between the UAE and East Africa, which historically and in terms of contemporary kind of life are really, very, really present and vibrant. Uh, we all of a sudden could commission this body of work. We could work with six theater makers in terms of the writers, director, the writers, performers, additional directors. We can we could create this sense of mentorship and collaboration that really focused on people working as equals. It was not about the. It wasn't about any one side sort of leading the other. It was about understanding the expertise that existed the local knowledge that existed, the different modes of theater making, the different modes of storytelling, the different concerns, the, the idea that uh, with a, such an open-ended prompt, the, uh, the playwrights 
were writing about what was important to them and in a way that was not the mosquito net play, right? That, that really gave them a chance to say, this is the work that I wanna make. Uh, it was, so it was really exciting for us to have that sense of discovery and introduce so many artists to our own world as, as curators all at the same time. And that was, I think, the, when I talked about radical trust in the beginning, uh, we really kind of, we entrusted Karishma and said like, there's no way that you can bring us up to speed on these artists. So we have to let go. We have to say, all right, these are the artists that you think are the right artists to do it. We're in, um, let's see where it goes. Thanks, Bill. And and one of the things that I think we often have a, a duo relationship if you have the presenter and the artist or maybe the commissioner and artist. And by creating a three-way collaboration really opened up a lot of questions, a lot of ideas. And uh, Brian, I want to put this to you because we often look from the outside and we see the performance, we say, wow, that was great, it was a huge success. But we often don't get to hear a little bit about what were some of the, the difficult times or the challenges that got us there? What, are, what were some new considerations that we had to think about and also to think about some of those shifting roles? So I'm wondering if you could share a little bit about that. Yeah, so I, uh, uh, I kind of originally, Thought about talking about this in a reverse order, but I'm going to go ahead and say the, the fun story first, which is uh, uh, and kind of how we got there. Um, so this last Tuesday, uh, I, I woke up from a, a nice night of sleep to some uh, text messages from Karishma that Nairobi had had a complete power blackout. Um, the entire city had no power. Um, and for a virtual show, that can be a bit of a problem. Um, and the the Two texts I got were, there is no power, and right below that, but the show will go on. <laughs> and I didn't really understand what that meant, <laughs> but it did. Um, uh, later that day, we ended up doing a full a full afternoon or evening of shows um, run completely on power banks and cell phone hotspots, um, which was something that we uh, had never tested, had never tried, uh, uh, but we got there. And I think it's a uh, it's a really amazing story because the way that we all exchanged information and approached the work um, as the three of us uh, 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 with knowledge in every single aspect, um, sharing everything we possibly could, it allowed Karishma and our incredible uh, stage manager in Nairobi, Henry Wamai, uh, to troubleshoot this while the rest of us were completely un unaware. Um, so by the time I kind of got around to it, everything had been solved. Um, and that was sort of, you know, I, I look back at all of the kind of key moments throughout, uh, the creation of it. And that was a, that was a really important thing. Um, uh, you know, the platform, Christine and I had, had worked with the platform originally and, and held that knowledge. Um, but we had to train everybody how to use it. Uh, we had to go into these actors' homes and uh, set up what is a pretty complicated uh, tech kit to be able to achieve that eye-to-eye -eye contact and access the platform. Um, you know, and some of the performers uh, see a, a pile of electronics and get excited by that, and others are completely terrified and want to leave the room. Um, so, you know, the challenge really becomes how do you communicate and how do you uh, how do you lead them through that setup process, through troubleshooting um, that, as we've been saying, meets the artists where they are, that they can still focus on the storytelling and still focus on uh, uh, the artistry, and um, yet they have to kind of be their own technicians. Um, so because all of that knowledge has to be, had to be transferred, again, our little power outage moment uh, went off successfully. Um, Prior to that, uh, you know, we had to get all of this equipment to Nairobi, um, we, <laughs> which, which uh, was a challenge in and of itself. We're all laughing about it now, uh, <laughs> which is good to see. Oh, so um, many sleepless nights, right? Go oh ahead. my gosh! Yeah, no, I, I, uh, uh, you know, we, we. It was sort of the one place that I feel like we we really sort of deviated from the values and the mission of what what we set out to do. Um, we trusted efficiency and what we knew would work over um, 
investing locally and uh, uh, and trusting. Um, so what we had decided to do was purchase all of the equipment that we needed in the U.S., um, put it all in a big box and ship it to Nairobi, um, where then it would be distributed by Wamai and Karishma and uh, uh, people on the ground there. Um, and of course, as soon as you put your fate in the hands of a shipping company, um, it's complete, you have no more control. Uh, and we quickly found that, um, uh, you know, not everything arrived and we were, we were uh, uh, having to reschedule everything um, almost daily, if not hourly, based on, uh, based on the updates we had. Uh, and the solution was to buy everything locally. Um, we ended up supplementing all of the gear that did arrive um, with locally purchased computers, locally purchased iPads, uh, cameras. Um, and you know, looking back at it now, we should have trusted that from the beginning, um, that, that uh, investing in the, in the city you're going to is really, really the best way uh, to support and to ensure that what you're getting is what you need. Um, and I think, yeah. Brian, you know, one of the yeah, things I, that while, while that was the, the difficult spot, I think that the what even allowed us to green light this was, as we all know, universities are not the most nimble in terms of payment structures and things like this and being able to contract a massive amount of people. And so having Octopus and all of us kind of come together to find to figure out the the fastest way to be able to make things things happen and to be able to say okay yes we can front this we can buy this now that it really took all of us being able to really think a little bit more creatively about ways that we okay this is easier for us so we'll take that on or where should the front of house staff person should they be in nairobi should they be in the in the uae or should they be in new york and so really having to think you know, try continentally about what might be the best way um, was really kind of allowed us to get as far as we did. Yeah, Krishna. and I think just to add, add on to that from, from a local perspective, I think, uh, Brian, the two examples that you've just given about the national, it was actually a national power outage uh, because there was a, a power line that fell. So my mom in Mombasa is calling me like, how, are you gonna, how is this performance gonna happen tonight? And I said, mom, it's okay. <laughs> We got this. Uh, she's an electrician, so it was very exciting to her that I said, you know, we had the we have the we have the electrical side of it covered. Um, but there's also this sort of local sort of knowledge exchange that was happening because um, the example of the of the laptops was 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 in the first run where we said, okay, we're going to import everything, and things also got stolen even though they arrived, right? Um, but the solution that we found this time around with the power outage was to use inverters and Wamai, who is absolutely brilliant, made sure that all of our um, uh, artists had a backup inverter in case of any power outage, because this is something that they'd also faced earlier on. Um, so, so just that shift of, okay, well, earlier on, you know, we could have thought of, okay, should we import these inverters? Should we, these are like battery powered generators that we use over here. Um, you know, it, it just speaks to even, from the commissioning process to our our first um, re rerun, uh, there was just a giant you know leap of learning from the technological side. Um, and and to be perfectly honest, for for me, when we first spoke about the heavy you know the amount of financial investment that was going to go into sending this tech, I was it was met with a lot of nervousness from my end because um, we don't necessarily have the most stable internet. We don't necessarily have the most stable infrastructure technology wise. And so I was a bit skeptical and, and scared because I, um, while I was very confident that the artists would deliver and that the performances would be you know, wonderful and that it would be a wonderful repertoire, I was not sure that we would be able to meet the technological sides. Um, and so the fact that we made it work, even when none of us had power, I think is a testament to our level of trust in each other, but also this sort of leaning on each other for resources, for support, for advice, and 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 so on. Yeah, I wanted to flag yeah. that. Um, I also think your uncle might have helped in some way, <laughs> <laughs> but but I think that that's beautiful because actually it's not just the one-on-one -on -one relationship between the actor and the audience member. It's really the one-on-one -on -one and personal connection, personal connections that happen between the people that are making the work. And as we say, theater for one is made by many. And it's really true. It's, it's a network of people that come together and who come together intimately and personally and collaboratively to make these experiences. And there's, there's something about the form that really invites 
that kind of intimate personal connection yeah. in all areas of the creation. And I love the, sorry, I, I, I love, I think the metaphor that, that Brian put forward about this idea of like, of, sh you know, kind of shipping, shipping the tech gear from the US to Nairobi, as opposed to investing locally, because often I think that's where these kinds of transnational collaborations happen, where there's like an assumption that the way we do it here is the right way and we're going to bring it to you and train you in our way of doing things. And I think in all of these examples, I think what, what we really learn in a very deep and profound way is that sense of we need to trust people who are making theater in Nairobi that they know how you get things done in Nairobi and that it doesn't matter how it works in the UAE. It doesn't matter how it works in New York. We have our ways of doing things, but you know what's going to work for you. And I think that kind of exchange and really trusting that this, the reciprocity of that relationship uh, and the and the openness of the communication and uh, and recognizing how little we actually understood about what life is like on the ground and, and not trying to pretend to know. We trusted that Karishma and Wamai, you know, and all of the, all the cast members and, and the local directors, they had that knowledge that would actually help bring this to bear. It's something we really talked about in terms of how do we make sure that what we're doing is with a, a mind on equity, right? And we're looking at several different economic structures, performance structures, and Karishma, I know that that was something you were really focused on, making sure that across all of the, the parts of the team that we were considering that and wondering if you want to talk a little bit about that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, uh, you know, similar to the mosquito net play structures, a lot of these sort of intercultural collaborations, particularly between the global north and the global south, place more emphasis on the financial investment. So the, the folks bringing in the money or the folks making the financial investments are the ones making the call, right? And this becomes very, very difficult um, in a project like ours that is so, I feel the, the production side of it is a performance on its own. The artists and their work is a separate performance. And then you have the marketing and you have so many other elements that need to be put together to bring this puzzle or this piece, piece to life. Um, so one thing that I really, really appreciated was, is that, and it still continues to date for us, I feel, is that all of us have an equal stake in terms of our, you know, in commercial speak, our buy-in is equal. It's not, you know, if one, if one entity has placed more financial uh, um, investment into this, it doesn't mean that they have more of a stake or they have more production rights. We're all sort of equal. We all bring in um, equal production opportunities. So there are folks who would approach me, for example, locally um, that may not approach Brian, but folks in New York might approach Brian, you know, with the desire to produce this further and the, the same in the UAE. Um, so so um, I think also a collective recognition that, that the value of no the knowledge that we are bringing is equal and will help us grow in the form of exchange um, was, was, was a very um, solid foundation for us to start on. Um, one other aspect that I really appreciated was all of us were able to articulate our needs early on. We didn't have the technological, we had Wamai, who was a brilliant, brilliant tech stage manager, everything, just a brilliant human <laughs> as a whole. Uh, but we, you know, we sort of articulated early on that this is where we are lacking. We need the tech experience, we need the tech support. Um, and I think, you know, with Bill and Lindsay, it was the same in, in articulating, um, the kind of local curatorial um, support that was needed. And, and so just leading with the need, as one of my mentors says, is, uh, was always a good good approach for us um, for this project. And if I could I add think to that. We, oh, sorry, Bill. Yeah, please. No, you go. No, go, 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 go. go. That at, the, at the heart of Theatre for One is the equalization of the relationship between the actor and what we call the audiencer, because the audiencer is playing as active and equal a role to the performance that's happening as the actor is. And so I think it is that interdependence and equalization that then ripples outwards throughout. And, and I think building on that idea of equalization and equity really is, you know, is pay scale as well, right? And the budget. And uh, I think often what happens in these kinds of transnational collaborations is that the people from the global south often get paid on a pay scale that is more standard in the global south, as opposed to what people doing the, the equivalent work 
in New York would be getting paid. And so one of the kind of early decisions we made was when we went through the budget with Brian and the team at Octopus, uh, and we understood what the pay scales were for Theater for One Here We Are with the US performers, we adapted that pay scale for all the Kenyan performers. There was not a sense of we're gonna treat the performers any different, even if the economic structures are different. That 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 fundamental equity was really important to us uh, throughout the process and having transparency about how people were getting paid. And if I can just add to that as well, I think what was also, um really appreciated was that there was always room for negotiation. So it's, it was not just about the pay scale in terms of what the actors were taking home, but I remember also expressing data. Internet costs here are not as cheap as they are in the US. So having a budget line item for um, covering data costs for the artists, which is something that is a very standard line item in our budgets here, um, and that being received without any sort of questions. It was a, yes, okay, so we trust you and we understand that this is something that is a need to make this work happen, so we'll add it in there. As well as transport and fuel costs, because well, my, you know, and a lot of our other production assistants and team members had to travel across Nairobi um, without, which doesn't necessarily have the most reliable transport system, so it becomes very expensive. So being able to um, adapt an international level of performance to the Global South context with a pay scale that is at the New York level, but then also a clear sensitivity towards some of our local needs was very, very appreciated um, and, and something that made it very easy to communicate um, with, with Octopus and, and uh, the Art Center at Abu Dhabi from our end to say, listen, we need this to make this happen. And, and um, that being responded to was very appreciated. And you know, thinking about the at the art center, as Bill mentioned, we had done a residency where we did um, theater for one. We are at here we are, and then we've commissioned this. And Bill, I wanted to ask in terms of the audience, and now having audiences that were based in Nairobi, the UAE, and New York, did you feel a sense of difference between those two residencies? Uh, I mean, what's, what's interesting, I think one of the things about the UAE is that it is such a transnational hub. And in our pilot season, we presented uh, a group called Just a Band, who were banned from Kenya. Uh, and what we found is they were, most of their followers were, were in Kenya and they were doing a lot of social media promotion. And what we realized is that the promotion that they were doing on the ground in Nairobi was resonating here in Abu Dhabi and Dubai because the Kenyan community is really in touch with one another across borders. So I think that idea of the sort of dissolving a little bit of the fiction of those borders uh, and that once we put something online, which is I think the thing that everybody has found as they move their programming online the past the past two years is that all of a sudden you do have access to a global audience. Uh, it was really fun, I think, being in the virtual lobby, which uh, which is a kind of a beautiful, very special place where you feel the presence of other audience members, but you only say their words like you're in a Jenny Holzer exhibition. Uh, but people would, would talk about where they are and you'd sort of realize you're in this audience of, of people from all over the world and people are responding to different cues. And I think I would be curious for Karishma, the, some of the feedback from the actors because they would they would do five to seven eight performances in a row with here's an NYU Abu Dhabi student who comes from Ukraine and now they're performing for somebody who's in Nairobi now they're performing for a theater critic from New York now they're performing for for you know somebody else somewhere else like what that was like to go from performance to performance with an audience that is unlike any audience you've ever gathered anywhere in a physical space. Yeah, um, actually, uh, Alea, who I was with earlier today, uh, was saying to me, you know, it's just so fascinating how this platform could, can bring so many people together um, in, in such an intimate way. Uh, one of the things that the trailer also highlights is the fact that there is an intimacy in a way that is different from a shared experience when you go to watch a Broadway performance with multiple people. Alea was saying, you know, I was in my thing performing as the gin and uh, opposite me, I had somebody who uh, possibly a musical theater writer from New York who was talking about how they're trying to make Sondheim's lyrics more obscene. And the fact that the two of us <laughs> were engaging in conversation while I was still in character and then they, this person dropped off and then was uh, rerouted to watch her performance again. Um, 
the fact that even in the second meeting, they still had eight to 10 minutes of conversation to make while she was in character, to her was just so humbling. And to her, you know, she, she expressed um, complete gratitude and so much hope for how, even though we are in the circumstances we are in, that a performance like this is unlike any other and can bring us together in community to empathize with each other's perspectives and to really understand, um, you know, the cultural context within which we operate. She also said something that has stuck with me that I'm still personally also processing, which is, she said, I'm not sure, um, or I'm not sure how, whether the artists or the folks that, or the audiences that were attending, um, if they saw this as spectacle or if they saw this as participatory ritual. And the fact that that one performance can take so many different forms and could mean so many different things for a, a range of different people, de depending on their backgrounds and cultural contexts, is really, to me, what the power of theater is and what the power of theater you know, should continue to be. Yeah, I'd like to say I saw her performance yesterday as well. And it really was so moving at 1.30 p.m to be sitting at my computer and out the window I can see the East River and the Williamsburg Bridge and the sky. And then I sign on and I go into this black floating void and I see words floating up and I write words back and I'm in conversation with people all over the world. And then I get taken into the performance space which is this artist's bathroom and her face is close to the screen, and my face is close to the screen. And as I, as I found when we were making these works, in the time of the pandemic, our computer screens became our prosceniums. And as theater artists, we're always trying to figure out how to break through the fourth wall. And so the glass of our screens is, is that fourth wall that we're always dealing with. And in that moment, she and I, I felt I felt the screen dissolve, and we, I was in tears uh, sharing the performance with her and just knowing that she was in Kenya and I was here in New York, and we were live, present with each other, hearing a story. And uh, it really is, it's, it's, quite a, it's quite a powerful experience, yeah. yeah. The, the work that they created is so beautiful. You know, one of the things that I think our three organizations um, all really value is the context of the performances as well as the virtuosic nature of them. So looking at how do themes of the works, how can they be lifted out? How can we talk about the ecosystems? How can we talk about the history of Nairobi's cultural scene? And so it was really exciting that we could, we had all of these performances and then we had, I think, around 11 or 12 outreach events that spanned from high school students, Emirati girls, all girls high school, to talk about how do you construct conflict in a play? How do you write a play? Um, how do we talk about collaborating across cultures? How do we talk about the creative process and drafting? And Krishma usually, Often, you know, one lead artist is usually set forward as um, the person who speaks to the company. And I think one of the things that was really exciting is that you really wanted to ensure that all of the artists had an opportunity to share where they came from. And Christine, I know that that was really important for you as well. So I'm wondering if both of you could share a little bit about the approach to that and why it's important. Go ahead, Krisha. Thanks, Christine. Uh, yeah, I think a large part of that decision or, or that desire also came from the fact that uh, one thing that was different about, um, one of many things that was different about our curation was that the playwrights performed their own pieces, um, as opposed to the earlier version where the playwrights were it was sometimes different from who was performing. Um, we are, we, you know, in, in Kenya, it's, it's very, very hard to say I'm just a producer, or I'm just a director, or I'm just a costume designer, because we're all in many ways forced to sort of take on all these responsibilities because we haven't yet developed that kind of niche yet. In many ways, that's a blessing in disguise because we are able to um, think, develop our pedagogical approach um, from that kind of learning to be much more multidisciplinary and be much more uh, inclusive of different aspects of theater making. Um, and from a long-term perspective, from a budgeting perspective also, to, to work with an artist that is multidisciplinary in that way um, is, is, is more exciting and offers more opportunities, I feel. 
Um, and so, so that really was what formed part of the, the desire to have each artist um, be able to share a workshop or to be able to share their approach, whether it's, uh, it was as part of a panel discussion or leading a workshop or collaborating on le devising a workshop together, um, just so that uh, NYU Abu Dhabi students and other attendees are able to get a different perspective um, from everybody. So that there's not just one you know, defined Kenyan approach to make theater. There's so many different perspectives, so many different ways to do it. And some approaches actually contradict others, which is for me what the exciting part is to curate uh, Mubi Kaigo's work that is very do documentary theater, verbatim theater, in contrast to Laura's, that is her writing reflections on her dreams that turns into a piece about aging. Completely different approaches, contrasting, contradictory at times, because one does not, you know, one demands sticking to the words in a way that the other does not. Um, but both of them are valid and can still be curated under the same umbrella. Yeah, I, I'm reflecting on the, the also the at the heart of, of this work, whether it's in person or virtual, is the idea of, of gift exchange. And for those of you who have read Lewis Hyde's book, The Gift, or Writing Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer, this idea of reciprocity and of, of sharing things in a circle is, is at the heart of how we make this work. And so we have created this space and a, pr a presenter or a producer gives us the opportunity to place that space somewhere. And then we pass off that gift to the writers who we invite to write the work. And we often invite the writers to write the work for a specific artist or for themselves in this case. And then that writer writes the piece and then the audience member gives the gift of their performance. The actor gives the gift of their, uh, the audience, you, you know what I mean. And, um, mm -hmm. and then in terms of working with the crew and the staff and the teachers and the students, that we, we pass our different contributions to each other and create space for each other to make work or to produce the work or to reflect on the work. And, and, and things pass between us in this manner. And we love working with educational institutions where we can work with professional artists as well as student artists to, uh, to collaborate in, in those instances as well. And also because the form is based on these micro plays, when we reach out to writers, we're, we're commissioning a piece that's three to five minutes. So they're able to respond in the moment to what they're feeling and experiencing and what they want to write about. It's not like you're going to a playwright and saying, can you write a 90-minute piece that takes a year to write or however long. Mm -hmm. Artists write from what's happening to them at this moment. And in some cases, in 2016, for example, Regina Taylor had written a piece that she rewrote after Donald Trump was elected. And in the middle of performances, we pivoted what we were presenting. Um, when we first made Here We Are, we commissioned six uh, black women playwrights to write work, um, to respond in the moment to what was happening in our, in our country, in our world. And similarly, by entrusting Karishma to, to identify which artists were the voices that she wanted to bring to us in this moment. It, it, we don't come to each collaboration saying, this is what we want to do. This is the artist that we want to work with. We partner with local creative team members who, who then gather the artists um, that, that then present within our venue. Thanks, Christine. Um, and just one more thing to speak to this idea of the gift or to speak to this idea of the exchange that I'd like to emphasize um, is really the, the, the resident directors and the assistant directors working with each other as part of this model as well. So we focused a lot on the artists and curating the works and then you know, writing it and rehearsing. Uh, but one of, the, one of the things that we started off in conversation with Bill to start off with was uh, being able to create a sustainable model, not only in terms of the technology, but in terms of human infrastructure that could continue this work were we to do another version of Theatre for One, or were we to commission, if we were to ever commission other um, playwrights across East Africa, for example, if this was to expand. 
Um, and given that this was the first time this was ever, this uh, work is ever, you know, premiering in East in Africa, actually, um, this this became even more of a prescient question. So Serja and uh, Khulud were the resident directors for this run of Theatre for One, but they worked with uh, two assistant directors, both Kenyans, Nyokafi Masharia and Esther Kamba, who uh, shadowed two productions with Sherja and uh, Khulud, and then had an opportunity to direct one of their own uh, for this run as well. So there really is now a model that in the future, for example, if this were to happen, you know, again in Kenya or to happen somewhere across Africa, that perhaps Nyokafi and Esther could also serve as part of the resident directing family um, to, to uh, support future productions or future runs uh, of Theatre for One. Yeah, it's the beauty of what this virtual platform allows us to do. We, mm -hmm. have, we now have two physical booths because we built a new theater during the pandemic that is COVID compliant and ADA accessible. But we take those physical booths into different communities and work with local universities or other producing teams and are able to have those collaborations. But now with the virtual platform, we can, we can take this this model all over the world, really, and as Karishma said, empower other cultures, other cities, other organizations to use it as a space for them to create work within. I, I want to circle back a little bit just to, to, uh, to one of the points that Karishma made about, about the workshops and the way that they were dispersed. Because I think one of the things that's interesting about the UAE is in a lot of this dialogue, we're positioning the UAE as part of the global north because of the, the resources. But in terms of where the performing arts sector is here, it's very, very nascent. And some of the conversations that are having and that young artists or established artists need to have are actually actually quite similar to those conversations about being an artist who has to wear multiple hats because you don't have that kind of infrastructure. Uh, the intellectual property uh, landscape here is just really starting to develop. So I think there was also within these conversations that we had for the Lamb Sisterhood, for example, talking about how they, as a three artist collaborative, create work and then manage the intellectual property and how they deal with the dynamics of being kind of a new theater company, coming up with a model that feels right and appropriate for their own context. Things like that, I think were also extremely exciting for just us to be in the room and for the impact it had on the artists in the UAE to be able to talk to somebody who's not coming from a, kind of a US theater model. Uh, so I just wanted to, to sort of flag that aspect as well. And I know we're just about to open up to questions, uh, but I do wanna ask one more question, which is how does this work stay relevant? I know that we're all longing to be back in the live space, in the theater together and feel that air. And yet this piece does seem like it will continue to be relevant. And I don't know if uh, Christine or Vila Krishma, Brian, anyone can really jump in um, on that. Well, I think what we've all discovered in various forms is that these online platforms, ours as well as many others, create radical accessibility and does allow for cross-cultural, cross-continental collaborations that weren't possible before. And so I think that that will definitely continue to be relevant. I think from, from our standpoint, I think, you know, we're back in this moment that we didn't think that we were gonna be back in quite so quickly where we are scrapping our in-person season and going back to online. Uh, so we had hoped that this was gonna sit in the category of what are the things that you learned during COVID that now that you're back in person, you wanna hold on to? Uh, and it, it takes on a different urgency, but it does still fit in that camp. I think that idea of connecting with a theater community that we want to really get to know in a deeper way and a broader way in one swoop is an idea that's really exciting for us. And so we're thinking about what are the other cities that are in the sort of geographic region. When we talk about the region, 
in the UAE. That could be the Levant in North Africa. It could be South Asia. It could be East Africa. It's all of those things. It could be the South Caucasus. So we're, we're thinking about the way that this enables us to do an aspect of our work that is not just crisis response to COVID, but is actually just a really deep and powerful way to make new work. To add on, I really think uh, we are at the intersection of building something that brings technology closer to the arts in a way that I have never seen before, particularly for this region. This work, uh, and we highlighted this in our Kenya-specific press conference also, is a breakthrough innovation in East Africa. It's never been done in this way, um, largely because of the challenges infrastructurally, infrastructurally that limit a lot of folks uh, from venturing into this territory. So in many ways, I feel we're sort of setting a trend um, that will move across the continent and will make our work, it will bring the platform to us because we've struggled to sometimes get to the platform because of whatever reason, funding issues, accessibility, visas being a big, big problem. The platform is now coming to us because our work demands it. Um, our artists are demanding it. And, and the work will continue regardless of whether the platform comes or not. But now the global audience has an opportunity to really just dive a little bit into what the art scene looks like in a, a city of their choice. And how wonderful is that? Thank you so much, uh, Karishma and everyone. And I want to open it up now to the audience, the live audience uh, at BAM. And Christine will be helping to facilitate those questions. Yeah, hi. So if anybody has any questions, um, please, we're excited to hear them. And we have and lots more. Have, yeah, there's a microphone. Yeah, great. Hi. was one of the audience members um, who got to experience the show early on. And it was the most intimidating experience <laughs> I've ever had. Um, and as I went into the space, and both at Times Square and Signature Theater, um, and was aware of the ephemeral opportunity that was about to happen, what was so incredible was um, I had never actually been given the gift of a work that demands that acute awareness of intimacy between two human beings. So I'm extremely excited to experience what you've all done here in the virtual space. My question is, when I came out of that experience, I wanted to know all of the stories. So I always think about, is there a plan, because I want to go and experience this, I cannot wait. Um, is there a plan to think about some world where all the stories in the world are told through this gift mm -hmm. at some point? Yeah, I mean, there are, there are so many dreams about how content could be created and shaped. I mean, here we've talked about going into one community and pulling six writers from within that community, but absolutely to take then the, uh, the theater festival version of that, if you will, and have a New York artist, a Kenyan artist, a South Asian artist, and to build a, a body of work that is um, from a multitude of voices happening simultaneously. And I've thought that way about the physical production as well. My dream would be to have six booths and you can go or 10 booths, I mean 20 booths, and see a different artist and a different um, performer performing completely unique work from a different country. The first time we presented at uh, Times Square in 2011, we actually did 25 different performances because we were really learning about the form. So there were dancers and puppeteers and poets and musicians, and it was an arts festival in a microcosm. So absolutely. And and the, the model of the virtual platform also does allow us, we could have multiple stations set up at the same time. So we've talked about that as well, of creating a studio whereby there are, well, and that could actually be happening in different countries too. So with a, enough stage management teams, the, the platform could be running simultaneously 
um, in greater numbers. In early days, people said, well, why do you have one audience member? Because multiple people could be watching the one audience member online. And for many, many reasons, that would make protosorial sense. But we have held our ground with the understanding that at the foundation of that is the one-on-one -on -one performance. And it's quite radical to produce work for one audience member at a time. It makes no financial sense at all. And when you look at, as I said, the many who go into making these pieces, but I, I believe strongly that the, the, the impact that it has for the people that work on it, the people that perform it, the people who experience it, it's, 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 a, it's a wise investment. And, um, and, and it, you know, I, I think about, I had this idea, like I said, 20 years ago, and to see it now beyond all reason traveling to different countries is, is a testament to that, I think. Yeah, other, other questions? Thank you, Linda. Thank you for that. Any other questions? Uh, hi, I'm um, Vallejo. Gettner. Oh, hi, Vallejo. Hey, Christine. <laughs> hey, Can you also say what organization you're with? Uh, well, I kind of work independently, and I, uh, but I work mainly with the Onassis Foundation here in New York. Um, it, so much of conventional theatre doesn't carry within it the notion of reciprocity that you were talking about so well before. So to see a work that is doing that is incredible. To see a work that's doing it digitally is kind of amazing. And I'm wondering, you know, what else are you seeing out there to, to you, Christine, but also to everybody else? What other works and what other ideas are you bringing that could do that? Because it doesn't feel like this is a condition that's going away. Uh, it, you know, there'll be waves and there'll be changes, but this is also something that we where that where we have a moment where we can you know we can make hay we can't you know we can we can choose to not waste the crisis and to develop new ways of doing this that um that are that are incredible and uh rather than just reversion and reverting back to what we had so i'm i'm kind of excited to hear about possibilities for new works that do this as well well, and I had the opportunity to see some of the work that you are making, um, this wonderful installation called Tree, which was so beautiful um, that you presented a few weeks ago. And I, I think you're right. I think we are, uh, we're on the horizon of a time which is not about, about reverting and this is, this is the, the exception and the crisis and then we'll go back to normal, where we are blessed with opportunities to think about how we can incorporate physical, digital, virtual, and bring all of those tools into the creation of, of theatrical work. I'm finding, I don't know if anybody else is finding this, but when I, I've been now to a few plays, typical plays, and I'm so used to doing theater for one and seeing the actor looking back at me or looking at a screen that, I'm still getting used to a live person on stage, but I find it really disconcerting when they're not acknowledging me. It, it seems oddly bizarre. Why, why are they not looking at us? Why are they, not, why are they pretending we're not here? And so um, I, I'm excited to keep bringing this quality of intimacy into all the different works. For me, that's, that's the, the, the linking idea whether it's an audience of one or an audience of a thousand, how can you create experiences that feel intimate? Or how can you experience the, the life of a tree in the Amazon forest? That all of these works are about trying to put yourself in somebody else's shoes as empathetically and equitably as one can. And Krishma and Bill and Lindsay and Brian, please speak to that as well, because I'm sure Octopus is developing other projects and things that you're doing with your other collaborators? Yeah, I mean, I think uh, one thing that comes to mind, um, uh, which you'll also know about, but is uh, uh, the work can take on a new level of specificity and can actually last um, in ways that live performance maybe could. We've uh, we've partnered with a, a 
really amazing artist named Annie Saunders um, who creates sound walks. Um, and she built the sound walk uh, in lower Manhattan and you know, it, it has currently ended its run, but, but it's a way that um, safely people can experience this art and in an intimate way that is for just themselves, um, or they could do it with a group, I guess, but uh, uh, that can last beyond the one week that the artist is in residence or beyond, um, uh, you know, the one season that it makes great sense to be outside. Maybe, maybe people want to do it in the winter. I don't know, but uh, uh, it's, it's those types of opportunities that we're, that we're always looking for and, uh, and are exciting to us, I think. And I think from a, a programming and producing perspective, it, it's also about when we're looking ahead, even when we make the assumption that we're going to be able to present kind of traditional live events, we're not making the same kind of assumptions and we're thinking about accessibility and we're thinking about comfort and we're thinking about uh, the audience in a very different way than I think we were a few years ago. So how do we ask these questions? How do we ensure that the, that the personal and intimate lives of the artists and the audience that was taken for granted in a certain way and we've had to wrestle with, we've had to think about that we don't let that go, that we actually continue to embrace that. So in many ways, um, there's lots of different forms, but it's also about reinventing our interpretation of the, the works that are meant to be more traditional. I think that building on that, there was there was a talk at APAP the other night about resilience. And one of the things that, uh, that the speaker was talking about was uh, this sense of grief that people are going through. And when you're feeling this sense of grief and loss, uh, that is not generalized, that it's actually, you miss something very specific. And one of her strategies was, think about the things that you don't miss. You don't miss looking for a parking space. You don't miss uh, kind of waiting in the lobby for 20 minutes before they open the doors to the house. You don't miss kind of having the person next to you jostle you. You don't miss not being able to have a glass of wine while you're having this really profound theater experience. Whatever it is, I do think that there are aspects of what the sort of the boundary blurring between the performance space and the personal space has opened up where you actually have to think about all the other rituals of what it means to be in an audience and what the things you want and how can you take care of an audience. Uh, and even in the sound walk, for example, uh, and what Brian was saying about things lasting, we'd work with Skip Shari and Coco Carroll and commissioned what was supposed to be an immersive choral piece that is super, super ephemeral. And instead it evolved into a spatialized 3D audio piece that still exists online as a website. And that was never a piece that was designed with any intention for permanence. It was intended to be a kind of a very brief snapshot. So I think there is that also that openness that you don't even know yet what forms things might take and that, uh, that you can play within that space. Yeah. Um, thank you, Vallejo, for that question. Yes. Hi, thank you so much. So my name is Xavier. I'm a um, performing art producer, but specifically with organizations in developing countries. Mm -hmm. So for example, Cambodia, South Africa, and then Kenya now with a project called Elimu. So it's very inspiring to see such a bold and innovating project happening in uh, Kenya. And so I guess my question is more to Krishma. Uh, I was wondering what is the artistic landscape over there, and specifically in terms of trainings for the artists? That's a great question. Um, I've actually heard of Elimo, so it's wonderful to meet you and uh, very exciting. I hope that we can connect over the next week uh, to talk a little bit more about this. Um, great question about artistic training. Um, I think idea of training generally has come from a very top-down kind of perspective, unfortunately, because of our colonial legacy and history. So um, a lot of programs that work with youth specifically uh, that still exist, unfortunately, um, you know, come with this idea of we know how to do it. You don't. You don't have any idea. So we're going to teach you our way because our way is the right way. And again, there's a lack of consideration for the fact that we don't necessarily, for in the film context, for example, don't necessarily have 10 cameras to shoot with. Um, at any given moment. Um, and so this is not to speak to a disparity narrative. It's not to speak to, oh, we don't have the resources. It's that we just use the resources that we have differently. Um, so 
I think that has been changing over the last few years because there is a collective awareness in our artistic community of the kind of training we need. So many producers, uh, many artists are now reaching out to their international counterparts and saying, we need help with tech. Teach us how to do this. And in return, we will teach you how to do this. So it's, it's not necessarily a, we know nothing and you must teach us everything. It is a very equitable exchange. This is what we aspire towards. Though there are, of course, still instances where training is quite top down, quite hierarchical, and there is, you know, one correct way of producing or making or, or creating work. Um, but we are now more aware of that. Um, and yeah, yeah, I would say I think uh, a little bit more sensitive about it, particularly with children, uh, because, you know, the youth are still up and coming and uh, we are very conscious of how their education, you know, uh, in the arts will affect the, the possibility of any sort of career as well moving forward. I hope that answers your question. Do you have a follow-up question? No, yeah, that's very interesting. Thank you. But I was wondering also what exists in terms of uh, public institutions in Nairobi or private schools for acting or for, well, yeah, what is the landscape of the, the, the curriculum uh -huh. for the artists? Yeah. Oh, oh, great, great question. So we do have a couple, you know, we have the Kenya National Dr uh, Drama Festival that still exists across public schools with various categories of performance that the uh, that young, young folks can apply to as well. Um, the Nairobi Musical Theatre Initiative actually is one of the uh, initiatives that offers a mentorship program where mentors, uh, Fred Carl, Deborah Brevoort, who are um, graduate musical theatre writing professors at NYU in New York, and Roberta Levito, who is a, a dear friend, mentor, and I'm sure many of you also know her, um, uh, was formerly, formerly with the Sundance Institute, are our three mentors, and they uh, work with artists, with, 30, with a team of 35 composers and collaborators um, to develop their musicals. Um, so that's an example of uh, a, a training platform, or actually a mentorship platform that is for uh, more professional artists. Um, and then we have mid-career artists as well um, that have uh, training opportunities with the Sarakasi Trust, for example. The Gotha Institute often does some work. Um, so does Alliance Francaise um, and a couple of other um, uh, school institutions. Uh, the Lamb Sisterhood offers young uh, training uh, programs for young children as well. Um, and the theatre company, the Arts Canvas, are also a couple of other uh, organisations that, that there's many more, but these are the ones that are coming off, off the top of my head. Do you two have each other's contact information? We need to make sure that that happens by the yes. end of the day. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Great. Yes, yes. I uh, would love to connect on the portal as well. Uh, special shout out to all the ISPA fellows uh, for this year. Please find me on the portal. I'd love to connect with you all. Great. See, if we were if we were all in Zoom right now, we could just say, put it in the chat. This is one of the things we need. <laughs> yeah. Or if we were on stage, I'd have done the thing where I came up to the edge and gave me my business card. Uh, so, you know. <laughs> Any other questions? Hello, thank you so much for this. Um, I don't know if it's a stretch to say I'm part of the NYU family, but I'm certainly part of the NYU uh, the institute, anyway, I'm an arts professor um, at Tisch, Liz Bradley, Bill, I know you a little bit. I can't tell whether I'm supposed to take the mask off or not. Here we are. Thank you, Christine. Uh, I floated in, it's true, a little bit late, so I hope this question isn't, isn't redundant. Um, I'm fascinated by Linda's evocation of the intimacy that was achieved through the online connection with Krishna. Um, what happens to what's captured in these exchanges? I mean, as someone who's been grappling, as, as many of my colleagues have been, with uh, you know, trying to, cr to preserve um, the integrity of the exchange while teaching remotely for kind of 18 months and figuring out what energy is landing, what energy is cycling, is not, any, you know, any or all of the above on, on any given day. Um, I'm, the questions that have been appearing to me, and maybe these are too many at once, but are things like, do people, in other words, your audiencer, 
Christine, feel less vulnerable because there is technology between the humans or more vulnerable because the technology means that the experience could be captured and therefore could have a life that might, I suppose, in some senses come back to haunt somebody. I mean, we certainly have seen instances where people would behave in certain ways through the mediation of technology that they might not behave uh, without that mediation. Um, I, I will only say that probably the most parallel experience I can think of is a one-on-one -on -one with an actor in Third Rail Projects, Then She Fell, which was an actor tucked behind a door, an image seen in a mirror, me as the audience member on a stool. Um, and I can only tell you it was so intense that I worried that I could barely stand up at the end of it. Um, and yet there was something reassuring about feeling that that actual human conduit was around that door. And of course, we're alone at our screens, even though we're creating illusion of not being alone. Anyway, I'm not sure if, how many coherent questions there are in there, but... I'll try to pull out a few. I, th I have a few answers. Okay. Um, uh, first of all, we, we really try to create the context for the whole experience so that the, the vi virtual experience I'm talking about first, in which the audience member uh, is, is exp you're, you are led to understand through the email communications that you have that this won't be recorded, that this is a live experience that happens in the moment. And so these virtual performances are not captured in that way. Um, and then at the end of the experience, you are invited, if you want to, to leave a comment in the guest book and to take a picture of yourself if you want to. So that there is a moment at the end of the experience where you do get to look and see other audience members who have been in the space with you. And, and in terms of the safety, also when you enter the space, the waiting area that we talked about, you are not seen, your name is not there. There's a certain kind of anonymity that I think does allow people to feel less vulnerable. And I, I can describe it as, you know the different voice, like you have the voice that you speak on the phone with, and you have the voice you text with, and you have the vi voice you write letters with? When you're in the waiting room, it feels more like you're using the voice that you write letters with. You, you type from, a, a really, from an interior space. So you enter into this experience through your interior space, and then as you exit, there is a moment to as I said, to take a picture and submit it if you want to and leave a comment for the actor if you would like to. And then the actors at the end of our runs are given all of those comments that were left so that that reciprocity happens for them as well, so that there is a, there is a feedback loop that happens for them. And, um, and you know, we ask people to be, res to be respectful, and if they're not, we can boot them off the platform. So we, we create a safe container in that way as well. I feel like there was one other thing I wanted to respond to, but I can't. <laughs> I, I hope I, I hit the bulk of them. Yeah, Did, thank you. Sorry, that I know. It was, no, it's beautiful. It was really beautiful. No, thank it you. It was a bit of a, a mind dump there, but um, so the big trust leap actually would be the beginning, which is that it will not be recorded, mm -hmm. because I wouldn't have that issue if I were joining you in Times Square or right, you know, or or somewhere else. Um, and, and then, I guess the, the, the follow-up question was, and, and now that you've shared that, that there's the comment feedback loop, uh, is whether you've noticed a, um, I don't know, a, a difference, I guess, um, between the comments that you would get from people who have experienced theater for one live versus those who have experienced theater for one virtually. I mean, did... did I, I would say they're pretty similar. Interesting. That, that the, whether it's in the physical space or in the virtual space, 
that one-on-one -on -one connection, the world falls away, whether it's the physical world in Times Square or whether it's your living room. You, 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 you are so with the person in that moment that that stays quite pure, it has been my experience. I don't know. Bill, have you seen Theatre for One in person? Yeah, I, I saw it in the, uh, the Bryant Park okay. manifestation. So, so yeah. maybe you can speak to that in terms of how you as an audiencer felt similar or different in your response. Well, I think that the, the thing that was really interesting, I think the guest book is actually really important, and I'm glad that you brought that up, because when you are in the booth, you still have that experience of so you walk out of the theater and then you're back in Bryant Park or whatever other public space you are with the other audience members who have just seen it, others who are on their way in, and you have that sort of shared collective experience of sort of anticipation and sort of, or, or sort of debriefing. What did you see? How was it? What was your experience like? And I think one of the things a lot of people have been struggling with with online theater is that at the end of the performance, you turn off your computer, you close the screen and you're alone in your room again. And so I think that that moment of the guest book and being able to scan other people's responses has been really important, just like the, the virtual lobby, that you feel the presence of other audience members, even though it's a one-on-one -on -one experience. And then as a presenter, I think that's the other thing. I think we all have the experience of being in the lobby or being in the audience and watching the show, but also watching the audience half the time, and then going out to the lobby and hearing the buzz. And in a lot of the one-on-one -on -one or micro-theater projects that we've done during COVID, there is that void that you get where you just don't get the sort of feedback that feeds you as a presenter. And so every night at the end of the night, we would get a copy of the, of the guest book. And then at least you have some sense of like, all right, did this land? How did it touch people? What, what were people thinking? How did it spark? And that's also why the sort of 11 audience engagement events that Lindsay spoke about were also so important because that became a place for people who had seen the performance individually to come back together and now share and reflect and talk about what the experience was as kind of an artistic experience and this idea that it became a body of work again, right? It was a collection of six plays. It wasn't just one play for eight minutes with you and one other person, but you were sort of restored back into a community. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. Any other questions? Good, I think, uh, are you putting your hand up or there? No. <laughs> um, okay, I think we might be good with questions then. Um, any, any further reflections, anything we feel like we didn't say that we wanted to say in the last two minutes? I would just say that, you know, it's been really exciting, I think, for us in the UAE, the relationships that we've had with, with the artists in Nairobi and thinking about the ecosystem and the impact. And Krishma, I'm wondering if you could just give a few last few thoughts on, has it made an impact? Where are these artists now? Yeah. Um, this has been, I mean, again, I have constantly over the last five months heard, you know, so many words of joy and celebration and gratitude for this project. Um, largely because, you know, some artists were in the space of not knowing what would happen, you know, during COVID, not only from a financial perspective, but also just creative generation came to a halt because everyone was, you know, you know, relying on their second, second side gigs to keep the house running. Um, so it's been met with so much gratitude, so much, so such welcome, open arms, um, and, and a lot of space for consistent growth in terms of artistic practice, in terms of being able to challenge themselves with this new form technologically, but also with the, with the material um, that they're sharing. And there, there seems to be this new fire and passion that's ignited to continue telling these stories in different mediums, um, in different forms, um, possibly even you know, in, in another version of Theatre for One, but with different stories and different characters and different um, uh, scripts. And it's actually funny because I, I remember this moment when I said to the artists after we had decided our theme was we are here, um, that, you know, you could write about whatever you want. And they looked at me blankly and they said, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> We've never, what? About whatever we want. 
And almost each and every one of them sent me over two to three scripts in the first round. Like, what do I write? What do I choose? What do we do? So there's always content. It's coming. And there's just, it's met with so much um, uh, gratitude and also and also a, a, a positive challenge. Because I think the work is ever morphing and changing and um, the space to be challenged, um, particularly in this difficult time, is, is really, really exciting. Um, and I think... You know, all the the feeling of being a part of this global family is is so felt here. Um, I really, you know, we've never met in person, but you are my family. You are our family. And now, by extension, uh, to the audiences that are watching this today or that will watch this later, you are part of our family. And so we we are so excited to be able to engage with you in this capacity and and hopefully build new relationships and share this work in different regions around the world. Mm -hmm. What a wonderful way to end. Thank you so much, Karishma. I want to send a huge thank you to David Bale for believing in the importance of this conversation and inviting us to speak about it, to Nora Fleury, to Ryan Guerra, and Liz Ausenbach, and everyone who put together this incredible moment and for all of you. And uh, we look forward to next time. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Now go have lunch. We're going to go have dinner, but you can go have lunch. Yeah. Great, thank you. Yeah, I just wanted to say one last thing because it came to me as you were talking that we keep talking about theater for one as like one person, but it's actually theater for one. That it, it is this idea of one body, one world. And um, thank you, Karishma, for your words that, that helped, helped that. Yes, so welcome to the one. <laughs>